All right, uh, let's get started. <clears throat> so where we last uh, left off, we talked about the uh, stick breaking uh, construction. Oh yes. Um, so of course, no, that should say nine four. That's a typo. All right. Uh, you should be keeping up with the reading nonetheless. Um, please make sure you're doing so. Project one is out. Uh, it is a programming assignment and it's to implement uh, the stick breaking construction uh, for uh, a dodecahedron. And so um, let's continue on with the stick breaking construction. And to jar your memory, um, you have a stick, and that stick has been broken into a number of segments. And the example we were carrying through in MATLAB, it was broken into six segments. Three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. And each segment has a label associated with it. In this case, uh, each of the sides, six sides of a die. So this section is labeled one. That's labeled two, three, four, five, and six. And moreover, each uh, segment uh, into which the stick is broken has the same length. In this particular case, each one is 10 units in length. So that's 10, that's 10. The segment labeled four is 10 units. Likewise, for five, that's 10 units. And for six, that's 10 units. And so the idea is that you are blindfolded. And because you're blindfolded, you don't have any preference uh, for uh, a region into which the stick has been broken. And you can imagine then tossing a ball up into the air. That ball is going to come to rest someplace on, uh, along the stick. And so if it lands, so to speak, on one uh, segment or length of the stick into which it's been broken, uh, you're going to effectively select uh, that label corresponding to that uh, segment. So we have some variables, and I forgot to mention this last time, so I'll mention this uh, now. You have two variables, one called high and one called low. And high and low are variables, and they're going to be used as markers uh, to mark uh, the high value and the low var value corresponding to each length of the stick. So we start out with high and low equal to one another, and then we're going to set low, keep low the same, and set high equal to the value of low plus the length of the stick. So high is going to be here, or H-I-G-H. -H. So now, whenever that ball, or that virtual ball, if you will, simulator ball, lands on a particular segment of the stick, what you're going to do is test to see if that ball lands on a value or a region along the stick that's between low and high, right? Uh, so what we're concerned about is the closed interval uh, between, or rather the half open interval between low and high. So that means we're going to include low. So we use a square bracket, but we're going to exclude high, right? Uh, so when we do that check, we're going to ask ourselves if the value for the ball is greater than or equal to low, right? That includes the endpoint uh, low, or if it's less than, and at the same time, it's less than high. And if that's the case for their test, uh, for that location where the ball lands, we're going to say the ball is in that particular region. And so we're going to iterate using loop uh, in MATLAB to now check where the ball is, if it falls in between that value of high and low, and then we're going to set low equal to high. So I can cross this out and write low and then high is equal to low plus the length of the next segment. So then high, the new value for high is here, the new value for low is there, and then we check again, right? So that ball is going to be somewhere between the high and low for the first version of high and low, for the next version of high and low, for the next version, until we reach this last region. So when we reach this last region, low is going to refer to this point, and high is going to refer to this point. Now, we've been saying up to this point that we're going to use the half open interval, right? It includes the endpoint on the low side, but does not include the endpoint on the high side. So in this case, if you reach the last segment, you're going to use the closed interval, right? Uh, so that check is going to say, is it greater than equal to the low value? Is it less than equal to the high value? 
because you want to include the endpoint because in truth when you throw this ball it could land exactly on that last value and you want to account for that okay any questions about this no questions make sense yes no yes Yes, um, Com Comlin, Comlin, okay. Um, so yes, uh, as Comlin stated, we are trying to figure out exactly which labeled seg segment or which break, if you will, on this along the stick, which piece the ball landed on. And so when we randomly select the value for this ball, it's going to actually have a value somewhere between this value, right, and that value. And so now we're using this construction uh, to actually implement that. So we're doing a value, and then we're checking uh, which range, if you will, which interval this ball's value uh, lands on. Okay, uh, any other questions? All right, and so one of the things I did is called normalization. So each one of these segments is the same length, right? 10 units. It doesn't matter 10 centimeters or whatever it is, right? Um, I can actually divide each length by the sum of all of these lengths. And when I do that, this first value starts at zero. This upper value is at one. I'm now shrinking them down so that the total length of the stick is one. And then proportionally, each interval is going to occupy one equal sixth. In this case, it's equal because each of the original lengths was one sixth of the total length. So in that case, if I divide each one of these by 60, which is the sum of all of the weights, this region is going to be 0.1667, and each region is going to be 0.16667 uh, in length, right? And so this normalization just shrinks it, but all the individual lengths, they still represent the same proportion, one-sixth of the total uh, length, okay? Likewise, if I wanted to, uh, for example, change these weights, I could actually change the way uh, the stochasticity or the probabilities associated with each outcome, in this case, one through six, how they play out. So I could take each one of these and make them say five, 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 and each one of these and make them 20, 20, 20. All right, so five, 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 20, 20, 20. In that case, uh, the four, five, and six outcomes will have higher probability than the one, two, or three outcomes, right? And the beauty of this construction is that you can change the probabilities without changing the code, really, not very much of a change. All you do is you just change the number in an array, in a vector, okay? All right, so let's take a look at that uh, in MATLAB and pick up where we left off, which was uh, in constructing this stick. And we'll look at some aspects of the code and finish of the construction and use that as an opportunity uh, to talk about other things like histograms, uh, et cetera. Okay, so let me bring up MATLAB, and we'll pick back up uh, with where we left off, uh, taking a moment or two to refresh your memory. Let me see, bless you. Uh, let me minimize that, okay. So where we left off, can everyone see that font? In the back, can you see that font? Yeah, okay. So we started out, and there was a, a vector, or an array, if you want to call it that, uh, called stick. And each uh, position in that stick is of unit 10. So we have an array of 10s, right? And it's six many uh, such 10s in this array. So the length of the array is six. Uh, and therefore, each of the outcomes associated with each position, all right, these are the breaks, the lengths that I alluded to before for each section of the stick, um, each one has equal uh, weight, right, and therefore we're going to have equal probability. Now, if I wanted to change it, I could make these 20, right, and that would change the probability of that particular uh, length of the stick. But I'm going to change it back to 10 so we can carry forward uh, this example uh, from last time uh, where we left off. So the first thing I do is I want to know how many breaks I have, right? How many items in this? So I take the length, right? Uh, and if I run that, I'll run it in the debugger. If we look at num breaks, of course, it tells us there are six. And to refresh your uh, 
memory about how MATLAB works, we also see in the workspace the contents of that memory num breaks. And if we wanted to, uh, when I double click on it, it brings it up and I could actually change that live uh, while it's running. It's the whole purpose of, of a debugger. Uh, so I compute uh, the number of breaks and then I also, uh, I'm going to normalize it. So this other variable norm stick gets the result of taking stick and dividing by uh, its sum. So because I have it in memory, interactively, I can interact with these variables. Stick is also in memory, and I can pull that up, and you can see it's a one by six double, so it's one row and six columns, so it's a vector, right? a so-called row vector, uh, and each position has 10 in it, and likewise, I can go into the memory window and change each one of these values, right? Um, but I'm not gonna do that right now. Okay, so um, if I typed in the interactive or command window, stick, oops, if I can spell stick, uh, it gives me all of the values uh, stored uh, in stick. Um, and I just got some static on this thing, so the sound will be better. All right, um, so if I type sum of stick, right, suppose you didn't know what sum did, I mean, you know what it is, but um, let me type uh, help sum, right? It's a built-in MATLAB routine, and of course it has available MATLAB help, and you can see everything that uh, uh, sum does. You can also search on Google. MATLAB has some pretty good online help and tutorials as well. So if I go back to my interactive window, one thing you'll notice is when I started out, my cursor was different from this K, right? Uh, that means that you're in the middle of a debug session, right? So I can type sum and give it the array stick, and you'll actually see it computes that sum for me. Right? Uh, so you can not only interact with things live debugging in, in memory, you can also uh, interact with them uh, through the command window. Okay, so we're going to divide each of these elements of stick, uh, a position in our array, uh, by the sum, right? Uh, and it's going to turn out to be 10 over 60 in each case, which is uh, 1 sixth or 0.1667. So let's uh, single step, and now you'll see here norm stick is created, right? Um, it created a new variable uh, in memory, a new data structure. It's an array, and if we look at the contents of it, we can see uh, there are six positions, one for each of the original number of positions, and you'll notice the value here is now the result of dividing each position uh, by that sum, right, 0.1667. Okay, so any questions about that? No? Okay. So now... This uh, R coin, right? That was just the variable name I chose to use. Uh, R coin stands for random coin. It's not really a coin. Uh, this represents that throwing of the ball. Now, if you didn't remember what rand is, okay, we can go into the command window and type help rand, and rand will produce uh, a random number that's so-called uniformly distributed, and you'll know ad nauseum in the next few weeks uh, what that means. Uh, but for now, it just means that every outcome is equally likely. So it'll uh, select a random number in the closed interval on the real number line between 0 and 1. And I know earlier I said, well, you can't identify them. Well, the computer does as much as it can down to the precision that it can represent or the number of bits in decimal uh, using 64-bit uh, uh, architecture. Uh, so we generate our random number between 0 and 1. It's between 0 and 1 because we've normalized the stick. Because if we sum all the lengths of the normalized stick, it will sum to 1. So we said sum norm stick, right? It sums to 1, right? If you add up 0.1667 six times, right, because there are six positions, you get 1. So it's essentially shrinking down this original stick that had weights of 10 down to be a length of 1 where each segment 10 uh, of length 10 is now proportionally the same, 0.1667, and that's called normalization, when you shrink something down to a 0, 1 scale. All right, so we select our random coin, and if you wanted to try rand 1, it gives us a random number between 0 and 1 on the closed interval on the real number line. We can run it again and again, and you'll see 127, 0.91, blah, 0.63, blah, and so forth. Right? And you could even test that out and show that it does, in fact, give you a uniform or equal representation uh, distribution of numbers between 0 and 1. And we can actually do a 
sidebar if time permits and, and test that out. So we do our random throw, if you will, of our ball. That's what selecting a number um, between 0 and 1 um, equally uh, likely all the different uh, values. And then we set the selection. So now this is where we initialize our low and high. These are those cursors, if you will, uh, that identify the low value along uh, the segment of the stick and the high value, the upper and lower bound of this half open interval. Okay. So any questions about this so far? That makes sense? Okay. Um, so we set low and high. So let's step through that. And now we're going to loop. There's our for loop. And so you can see in the MATLAB interface, you have this collapsible uh, control here, right? It looks a lot neater if you're looking at a large set of code, if you can collapse things and uncollapse things. And that's just something for um, beautification, if you will. Uh, but it doesn't really mean anything to the program. It's just what you're seeing, right? But the underlying text of the program uh, is still there. Okay, so we have our for loop, and we're going to use that to iterate over each of the segments, or each of the breaks, if you will, or pieces uh, of the stick, right? And so we have six of them, uh, and num breaks here handles that because that's the return from the length, uh, which counts the number of positions in the array. So the first thing we do is we set low to high because we want to initialize it, and then high is going to be whatever low was plus the length of that ith region of the stick. So if i equals one, and in MATLAB, uh, when you iterate in the list, it's ones based, not zeros based. Whereas in Java and C and C++, it's zeros based. Uh, so we start out i is equal to one, and recall what it means uh, for this uh, list of numbers over which i iterates, right? Uh, if we said one colon one colon num breaks, right? The first one says, where are you going to start? You're going to define a list of numbers. You're going to start at the number one. That's what that first one is. Uh, the second one, separated by or delimited by colons, means you're going to increment by one each time, right, in your for loop. And then num breaks is where you're going to stop. So if I did that, right, you'll notice I get that list return one, two, three, four, five, six. If I did one colon two colon num breaks, it's going to start at one. It's going to end at num breaks, which is six, if it can, and it's going to increment by two instead of by one, right? So it'd say one, three, five. So what I'm doing in this for loop, the semantics are such that um, it'll take this variable i and assign to it each of the numbers resulting from this list operation, okay? And it's similar to what's happening in Python. I don't know Python syntax well enough to say it off the top of my head. Question? It starts at the first index. And so if, and that's a good question, I could say 0 colon 1 colon num breaks, right? And it would start at zero. But I chose to start at one because I know that in MATLAB lists are zeros based. So if I try to access, so here is um, norm stick, right? If I try to access the zeroth position, it would give me back an error. Array indices must be positive integers or logical values. It can't be zero, right? If I were to access the once position, it's a valid position, okay? So you could absolutely start it at zero, but the problem is you would get back a, an error because lists in MATLAB are, are ones-based and not zeros-based. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. So, all right, so we'll start out, and the first thing we'll do is, uh, oops, almost, all right, let's step, and let's look at what high and low are. So low starts out as zero, okay, and high starts out, uh, 0.1667 more than low, right? Because each stick uh, length was 0.1667 once we normalized. So we do that, and we're just going to do a little printing because it looks nice for the sake of demonstration. And this is now where we check the half open interval. So here is the random coin, our coin, which in this case just happens to be 0.2785. For this first break, which has low value of zero in the half open interval and high value of 0.1667, is it greater than equal to the low value, right? So that's that square brace for the half, uh, the, the closed part of the half open interval, or is it less than the high value, right? Um, so less than instead of less than equal to. All right, so if it is, then you're gonna keep that selection. And then after you get that selection, you know you have a hit, it's in that region. So we want to break, 
right? That means stop iterating with the loop. You're done, right? Now, we haven't gotten to the section about what happens when you're in the last region, but we're just going to kind of run with this um, and develop it um, over the next uh, few minutes. Okay. Any questions? Make sense? Okay. So you'll be doing the exact same thing, but instead of using six breaks, you're going to have to figure out how many breaks for the dodecahedron. All right. So let's try this out and see what we get. So let's run it. Oops. Let me get rid of the breakpoint. Continue. Oh, DSIP. Okay, I had a typo. DISP. All right, so let me clear. Oh, and when you clear, CLC stands for clear the console, right? That gets rid of all the text. So if I said A, B, C, you know, whatever, and I said CLC, you'll notice it goes blank on the console for the command window. But if I say clear, C-L-E-A-R, watch what happens in the workspace. All of that memory is, is wiped away. So it just zeroes out all that memory, and now your variables are gone. Okay? And so it's just sort of automatic, clear, C-L-C. It just, you know, you get used to, to that. But the two are very different. Okay? All right. So let's run this and see what happens. We'll notice here, all right, we'll see that it's iterating through all the low high values associated with each of the breaks on the stick. So it's 0 and 0.1667, then low is 0.1667, high is 0.333, and likewise, right? Until eventually the last one is 0.8333 and 1.0, right? So high and low identify all the high and low values corresponding with each break. The first line is the first break, the second line is the second break, third break, fourth, fifth, and the last and sixth break. Okay? All right. So now let's do our, let's make use of our selection. Um, I didn't use it. Display message. Okay. So now I'm going to print out uh, whatever that selection was uh, from that random coin. So clear, C, and let's run this again. So the selection was six, okay? So let's run it again and see, just to make sure, because it shouldn't be six all the time, right? Selection was one, hmm, okay. Selection was six, selection was six, selection was three, five, one, three, six, five, that's weird, four, uh, four, okay, got something else beside those. All right, so it kind of seems like it's maybe working, but there's a little bit of a caveat, right? And the caveat concerns that last break, right? We said half open interval, but if you're on the last break, it should be the closed interval, right? Uh, let's bring that up as a reminder. That last break here should be the closed interval because you're now at the last one and you don't want to exclude that last value of exactly one. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at that, uh, what we're going to do to change this. So we know that if you're on the last break, that means if you're accessing that last location, which just happens to be num breaks, right, um, for our i value, uh, then you know you're going to do the closed interval. Otherwise, you're going to do the open interval. So let's say if you are not at the last uh, break, right, so if i is not equal to, now not equal to is um, tilde equal on MATLAB, all right, and that's something you can Google search. If i is not equal to num, breaks, that means you're not on that last section. Now, I have an extra parenthesis. I'm just sort of, I kind of mentally automatically uh, do an enclosing parenthesis. If it's not equal to num breaks, so if you're not on the last section, do what you would normally do, else do something else. Okay, so now let me indent this a little bit. I like to use two spaces. You can use as many or as few as you want. Uh, so it's a lot more apparent uh, where the blocks of code begin and end for our statements, okay? So if you're not on the last section, i is not equal to num breaks, you proceed as normally checking the half open interval. In that case, we're using this greater than, equal to low, less than, high, all right? Okay, so let's now take a look at what we would do here in the else clause, right? So one, two. If 
the check is going to be if r coin is greater than equal to low and r coin is less than equal to high right so the test is different for membership if we're talking about that last uh segment okay and right and you'll notice whenever i type a block right and this is really important right and this will help you uh, avoid lots of really really bad programming errors um you notice every time uh i write something like i'll say if right i'll draw make the statement and then i'll immediately say and if it has an else in it i'll say if i'll write the statement else and then immediately say end. Um, I like to define the opening and closing of every single block when I first create the block, right? So that way, you know, you never have this huge mess of propagating errors in your code, whether it's Java, Python, MATLAB, whatever, right? A lot of times people will say, oh, if I'll write my code and then I'll say else and then get excited and go do something else and forget to end this, right? And so the problem is, um, when you do that, of course, anytime it sees further down someplace some end, it's going to associate that end with that else, right? And you get lots and lots of problems. So one method of when you write programs is to mentally train yourself to end the block. So your block is always defined, your blocks of behavior, whether it's a while loop, whether it's a for loop, whether it's an if, a conditional switch, what have you. So that way you don't fall into that trap of leaving your blocks unended, and then you have some problems. Now, I know most of you learn Python, and Python, well, I hate Python, but I do Python a little bit, but Python uses indentation to define the blocks. It doesn't have formal delimiters. So certainly in Python, when you write a block, you have to make sure all the statements that belong to that block are indented correctly, right? Uh, and there are philosophical reasons why I don't like that. I like explicit delimiters, but you have to learn it because it's popular. Okay, um, so that's a bit of advice. When you write your code, define the begin and end of the block, so then you won't have those really difficult uh, to find propagating errors um, because your block doesn't end, and it'll assume that everything else below it belongs to that block until you explicitly uh, have a termination uh, delimiter for it. Okay, so what do I do if you're the last block? Well, if you're the last block, well, you similarly set your selection is equal to i, and you break. Okay, now the reason again why I have this if not the last block, else do something else, that means you're in the last block. So let's put a little comment there. Last break on the stick. Okay, let's save. And that's how you put comments in MATLAB, you use percent sign, right? All right, so, and everything to the right is a comment, uh, right of that percent sign. So uh, we have two different ways of checking to see if this random coin, our coin, has a value. Uh, there's one way of checking the half open interval if you're in the first uh, n minus one uh, lengths of the stick, and if you're on the last one, you have to check the closed interval. So we have this greater than equal to and this less than equal to. Okay, any questions? All right. So let's try this out, save. And of course, you know, it works, so let's clear, CLC. And let's try running it. Selection is six, five, 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 three, four, two, five, et cetera. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's use this a whole bunch of times. So we have our selection, we have our random coin, but our normalized stick stays the same. So let's define a big loop, and let's run this some number of times. We'll call them uh, number of trials, right? Like an experimental trial. You flip a coin, you roll a die, that's a trial. A trial has an outcome. So let's say num trials is equal to, let's say start out with 10. Okay. And so now we're going to say for t equals 1, increase by 1, num trials. And because I like to define the block, I'm going to 
um, go down here and oh, not done and I'm gonna end that outer loop end okay so you notice here that's where these collapsible sections come in handy right there's a lot of stuff going on in here but I don't want to have to look at the stuff I already know works which is setting that selection from uh, that stick breaking construction so I'm gonna collapse the four and I can see um, most for the most part that outer loop right okay so some number of times I'm gonna flip my random coin right uh, I'm going to set my selection set my my low and high and I'm gonna go through that stick breaking construction right that's gonna give me a value of selection once I get to the end here right so I want to save all of those selections right so I'm gonna save them each time I iterate through through that trial so I'm gonna need a place to put them so let me say the selections equals zeros um, one by num trials so what that's gonna do it's gonna create an array initialized to all zeros and it's gonna be one row and num trials in this case num trials is 10 num trials many uh, columns so each time I have a selection right I have a selection at the end of each trial right because here I have my inner loop when that loop terminates because I break when I get a hit on the length of the uh, of that uh, stick breaking construction at this point I have my selection ready on line 46 so what I'm gonna do I'm gonna say the selections right the teeth selection on trial number T I'm gonna set that equal to whatever selection was the result from that four block where I iterated uh, along the stick okay any questions about this does that make sense yes everyone's feverishly typing <laughs> that makes sense so I'm modeling the stick break okay so let me save that and I'm gonna get rid of this print right because if you're doing something 10 times 100 times it's kind of too much to print out every single time uh, convinced that it works so every time I try to display message I'm just gonna comment that out right um, because it just gets too uh, wordy uh, on the on the display so I'm gonna save that and I'm gonna set a breakpoint here and at the end of this outer block for iterating over the number of trials 10 many trials I'm gonna have the selections is gonna have 10 positions and each position is gonna contain the selection for each one of those 10 trials so let's try that out so I'm gonna run that and then you'll see the selections and I'll look at the selections there are 10 of them we have a one, a five, a five, a two, a six, a one, a three, a three, a five, a five. Okay, that seems like it's kind of working. So let's try to visualize this. And the way we visualize this is using a histogram. A histogram, um, and we will get to it more in detail, um, is an accounting of all of the unique values that you have, right? It's how you visualize uh, a distribution, right? And in MATLAB, there's a routine called hist, help hist that gives you a histogram now if you display a histogram you give it the numbers and you also need to know how many so-called bins there are now what a bin is for a histogram is the set of values corresponding to a particular outcome now if you call histogram and you give it uh, an array of numbers it'll produce that histogram and it'll tell you each number and how many occurrences of that number. Now, the fact that we have six outcomes, right, that means we want six bins because we want to uniquely identify all of the six outcomes. How many did outcome one happen, outcome two happen, i.e. that length of the stick, okay? So let's call hist because at this uh, point, right, we have set the selections and we want to call hist of the selections, selections, and I'm gonna set a variable called number of bins and the number of bins is gonna be uh, the number of breaks one bin per break because we want to uniquely identify each of those breaks now I'm choosing names to try to make it self documenting so it's understandable but you could absolutely um, comment your code and I encourage you to do so so num bins is gonna be the same as num breaks and this is gonna pop up a histogram that's going to give us an accounting of how many 
oh histogram instead okay so they changed it histogram there we go all right I get a warning from matlab as they release newer and newer versions sometimes the api calls change okay so let me look at histogram to make sure it hasn't changed x scalar number of bins okay all right so let's do that so let's run this we run it and we'll notice here a graph pops up and I need to fix the labels well you'll notice here that there's a number in the center of each of these bars that's the bin right so we have six bins and along the horizontal axis so this has been one this has been two been uh, oh that does not look good let me do that all right so we have bin one bin two bin three bin four bin five and bin six right bin corresponding to the sixth break we have one occurrence of a one we have two occurrences on the vertical axis here that's the number of occurrences we have two occurrences uh we have two occurrences of a three no occurrences of a four uh two occurrences of a five and we have three occurrences of a six right okay so of course that's not very uniform right um we don't have equal representation let's try increasing the number of trials five times to 50. so 50 times we're gonna throw a ball to select a region from this stick and let's see how that histogram changes okay you'll notice it's close to being very flat meaning equal uh counts of each of the outcomes one two three four five and six so this is the sixth bin that last one there are seven occurrences here there are eight here there are 10. so let's try an even larger number of trials right so let's try like um uh, a thousand trials right so a thousand times we're going to throw this ball and it lands on some region of the stick okay so we save that and let's run it and let's take a look at the histogram you'll notice it's even closer to being uniform right uh and so that's just to say of course if we were to increase the number of trials let's try 10,000 10, 10 fold so 10,000 times we're going to try uh, this game, if you will. It's for the most part even, right? The difference between uh, 1644 and you know 1741 is not that much. I mean, if you really wanted to go uh, crazy with it, um, hopefully it doesn't take too long to execute. We could try 100,000 trials. And we can see that as you increase the number of trials, it gets closer and closer to being uniform. Now, 100,000 is a lot, and it's for the most part, it's straight across, roughly equal counts of each of the outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, question. Why did we... How many, how many trials? 10,000. Must be something with random number generator. Sometimes you have just a... Just weird things happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless there's something in your code or the algorithm, um, it should, as you increase, especially tenfold, um, it should flatten out quite dramatically. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Make sense? Okay. So what if we wanted to make it just two outcomes? Right? That's kind of like a coin, heads and tails. They're equally likely. And let's kind of ratchet this down back to, uh, say, 10 trials, right? So now I just change the length of the stick, number of items. Each one is equally likely, the same length. Um, nothing else changes. You'll notice that, right? Because I'm using these variables to help me do things. So let's save that, and let's try that out and see what happens. So outcome one might be heads, and outcome two might be tails. So let's run that. So guess what? We ran it 10 times. We have five and five okay um now certainly you can play with the axes and label them differently and the bin labels and stuff like that in the interest of time i'm not going to do that i direct you to online help and other things like on stack exchange okay all right so with the coin example well outcome one is 10 outcome two whether you want to call them heads and tails or whatever um what if we now changed it to 20 versus 10 right so that means uh the second outcome is now uh, twice as likely because the length is twice as long uh, as the first outcome, right? So if we do that, 
save and we run it, we'll notice, oh, you know what? It's ordering them differently. Uh, one outcome is twice as big as the second outcome. Why is it ordering it that way? Let's try this out because we only did 10. I wasn't expecting that. So let me try 1,000 because it's very likely in just 10 flips you're going to have edge cases. Um, all right, so let's run that. Ah, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. So we did 1,000 flips, and the first outcome, there are 334 times we had the first outcome, and we have 666. Wow, that's pretty much twice, right? So you can literally control uh, the biases or the probabilities associated with each of these outcomes. If I wanted 3 to 1, right, so maybe that's 30, and that's 10, right, um, and I run it 1,000 times, you notice it's 3 to 1 in terms of the number of times it comes up value 1 is 243 times and value 2 is 757 it's about 3 times so with a stick breaking construction the beauty of it is that you can define events and these events occupy certain positions so if i were to document this i would say something like uh stick uh controls the probabilities associated with my events so then i'd say something like stick position one is heads and maybe uh, stick position two in your program is tails right so now you could actually have a cell array stick names and then you could say oh the first one is called heads the second one is called tails right and in that uh, uh, regard. Now, when you have a selection, let me stop this. When you have a selection, uh, instead of using a decimal for the selection, now we can use a string, percent %s, and now we say selection names give me uh, the the uh, selection, there we go. All right, use selection to tell you which name, and then selection names are the list of names. So now if we displayed it, let's try this out. Run, oops, selection names, did I? Uh, oh, stick names, not selection. Stick names. Stick names. So it says heads, right? If I continue, tails, 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 heads, tails. So now you can associate names with each selection uh, using a cell array where there's a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, association correspondence between the position on the stick, the break on the stick, as it were, uh, and the name that you associate with it. Okay? All right. Um, any questions about this? Does that make sense? No questions? So um, you'll be doing this. I could certainly post it on uh, the website associated with the slides for the, for the lecture uh, area of Blackboard. But I'd really like you to know how to do this yourself. It's not just about taking the code and you know vomiting it back out at me. It's about learning how to do this, right? Um, it's a very clever construction that's used uh, for producing samples that mimic uh, real stochastic systems, okay? All right, so if there are no questions, uh, let me switch back to the slides. I will exit MATLAB, and we will continue on uh, with uh, today's uh, material. All right, so let me put this back up, and nope. There we go. All right, so let's continue on. All right, so that's our MATLAB. We talked about uh, histograms. Um, we didn't do plotting. We don't need it for uh, this programming assignment. Maybe on Thursday's module, I'll talk a little bit about uh, plotting, right? Um, and we talked about looping. We talked about the environment. Um, and when you do uh, hand it in, uh, please make sure you follow the instructions and use zip uh, to zip things and use your name in the name of the assignment. And please make sure, and I'm going to repeat this again and again and again, 
uh, that before you hand something in, upload it to Blackboard, make sure that you unzip your zip file and make sure that it runs um, what you're handing in. Uh, because I will not grade something that doesn't run. It's an automatic zero. I'm not product support. And I'm not going to spend time doing that. And I have a right uh, to not do that. Um, when you uh, implement MATLAB programs and hand them in, uh, do not save your workspace. Uh, it should run from your MATLAB file, not assuming that you already have stuff loaded in your MATLAB uh, debugger environment. A lot of people make that mistake. Also, when you load things, load files and stuff, data files into MATLAB, make sure that the data file is right there next to the program in the same directory. Uh, don't give a path uh, to your home directory because when I download it, I don't have that path to your home directory. Make sure that all the code is there, all the data is there, and that it all happens from running your program and only from running your program. Do not lose points. Do not get a zero for something that's a careless error, right? Um, but there are 17 of you in the class. It takes me about half an hour to grade these assignments. I do look at everything, and I can't afford uh, to waste time on something that's fixing someone's careless error. So please make sure it runs. That's primary, OK? All right, if you have any question, please uh, direct your questions to Slack. It allows me uh, to, as they call it, an Army Research Lab to force multiply, right? Um, because at least half of your colleagues have the same question. Um, I can, you know, impact more people by answering the same question that half of you have, right? So if it's something of a personal nature or academic related to grades, um, please use your DSU address, email address. Um, there is a law called the Federal Rights to Privacy Act in Education, or FERPA, um, and uh, we are all bound by that, and I will never discuss your academic information in the presence of your peers, um, and I won't even tell your parents, all right, unless you've signed a specific waiver and have that in the department. Right? Your academic information is your private information, um, and I adhere to that. Uh, so if there's something related to something personal nature or academic nature, please email me uh, from your DSU address. If you email me from a Gmail and ask for something uh, related to grades information, I'll say use your DSU email address because that's your official email address for that type of information. Okay, uh, so that being said, uh, any questions? Any last questions? No? All right, so let's uh, continue uh, with the substantive material we have for this module. Okay, we are, what, to 115? Wow, that went fast. 1249, okay. Um, so. Who has an iPhone? Anyone have an iPhone? Now this iPhone, gosh, wow, well, that's a demographic. I have an iPhone too. Anyone have Android? Have Android? You have both? Wow. All right. Okay, so this is the iPhone. I think this is what, generation six? Um, generation six, so, you know, it's old slide, old picture, but I reuse it. Um, so this is an iPhone. And if you were to open up the iPhone, don't open up your iPhone. You avoid your warranty. Uh, so don't say, Dr. Holmes said, uh, open my iPhone. No, don't open up your iPhone. You will certainly avoid the warranty. And some manufacturers, if you're curious, will actually coat the screws with wax, right? The wax hardens, and they can tell if you opened it up, right? Um, so there are many opportunities to avoid your warranty. If you're, you know, you're not using it, whatever, and you're curious, do whatever you want to do. It's your property. But don't open it up. I'm just saying if you opened it up. Okay. So what if I were to tell you? An iPhone has actually very little uh, inside made by Apple. You believe that? Yeah, some of you do. Well, it does. Very little is made by Apple. So if you open it up carefully, you notice a lot of it is battery, right? Because that's the big deal, right? Um, if you're going to send information wirelessly, whether it's voice or data or what have you, the single biggest user of power is sending wirelessly because that antenna needs to power up with a lot of current and transmit through the airwaves electromagnetic energy right so you need a relatively big battery so you open it up you see a lot of battery and if you were to spread all the parts out well that's the shell here right uh, this is the lcd whether it's you know retina display that's just marketing or what have you and of course this is the ribbon cable that's the electrical connection to the LCD. This is the battery. So I'll mark that B. Um, then it looks like uh, that's the main processor board, right? And this is the shell, the back shell. And it's typically some sort of metal or carbon fiber because you want it to be rigid, to be strong and durable, 
right? You want to be able to sit on it. It's not going to bend uh, too easily. And then you have some other hardware. This looks like some sort of memory interface. And then camera. I can't quite find the camera. There's the camera right there and the ribbon cable for the camera. So you have a bunch of parts, but really the guts of this thing that make your phone your phone is really just all this stuff, the processor board and the chipset. It's really not that much stuff. All the other stuff is protection, display, and there's a lot of battery. Okay, so if we were to look at that processor board, you notice the names here. Very few names say Apple. Well, this is a collaboration between Apple and Texas Instruments. Now, Texas Instruments, they design chips, and I dare to say they're much better at it than Apple. So they have hardware engineers and computer engineers at Apple uh, working on chips, and hopefully no one from Apple watches the screencast and <laughs> takes offense, but it's true. And Texas Instruments, or TI, they have chip fabs, right? So if you want to make your own custom chip to do something, you collaborate with TI, you have to pay them to do that, uh, they will fab it for you, work with you, your engineers, uh, to make a custom chipset. Likewise here, we have something by Apple. It's the audio amplifier, okay? Um, if you're going to drive a speaker, right, uh, send audio output, you need to boost that voltage. Uh, and you also have power management, uh, the turning on and off of parts of your system to try to s preserve energy, especially... Uh, like, say, for your antenna, your transceiver, uh, if you have no incoming data, you can certainly shut off parts of your circuit board uh, associated with incoming data, right? So the rest, you'll see things like uh, a touchscreen controller. That's by Broadcom, right? That's another company. Now, you know, there are only a handful of companies that really do this, right? So maybe, you know, for network chipset, maybe about half a dozen, four to half a dozen uh, four to six uh, manufacturers of network chips. And the only other difference is the secret sauce they put into this uh, for um, things like power management and, you know, the coordinated control of stuff. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot of, for example, the Murata, the Wi-Fi uh, chipset for, for wireless uh, communication. There's Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and FM radio. The FM stands for frequency modulation, and that's the radio used for talking to the cell tower, right? So you'll notice here, very few things made by Apple, and all of these things kind of work with one another uh, to give you this uh, set of behaviors you call my iPhone, right? Uh, so very little is by Apple. So you might wonder, why do I pay Apple all this money, right? Because they certainly work with others and pay for the engineering, and you're paying for all of the tests to make sure things work reliably, and they also have to pay uh, their uh, original equipment man uh, providers uh, that provide them things as well. So one of the uses of probability, and we'll study this uh, for the next couple of modules, uh, is uh, reliability, right? You have systems, kind of like an iPhone, and these systems have a bunch of components, and these components interact with one another. For example, the power management interacts with a bunch of different uh, subsystems. It can turn them on, can turn them off. Uh, you ever notice sometimes if you go on a road trip, sometimes your cell phone gets really, really hot, Right? And the reason for that is when it senses that the wireless signal to the cell tower is really, really low, the signal strength, it boosts the power to the antenna. Right? And that boosting the power to the antenna is to increase the signal so that you can maintain connectivity with the cell tower. And a side result of boosting that power is that the phone heats up. Right? Uh, so that's why. So this power management is one of those components that interact with other components to give rise to things like boosting your power for you in order to main connect, uh, remain uh, connected to the local cell, cell tower. So sometimes in your system, uh, these components interact, and sometimes uh, these components fail. They don't work as they should, or perhaps they break uh, entirely. And so one of the questions uh, that you might ask is, given how certain components interact with one another, can you determine the system's behavior? Because it's really, really important if, say, that power management fails, what else in the system is going to fail? So some pieces of information you need is what are all the high-level components? With which other components do they interact? So you need some way of representing or encoding the interactions between these components. And then what is the rate at which these individual components fail? Now, if you look up any uh, specification, like the Qualcomm PM8019, right? If you were to Google search that, uh, you come up, and I'm not going to do that now in the interest of time, but if you Google search it, you're going to come up with uh, a chip specification, 
of that particular chip from Qualcomm. And one of the things that you will read on that chip specification is the mean time to failure, right? Um, if you use it so many times, how often is it going to fail? Because nothing lasts forever, right? If you use a chip again and again and again and again, sometimes it's going to fail. That might be a hard failure uh, where it's just done and gone, or it could be a soft failure where it just hiccups and you just need to power cycle. Okay, so if you know the failure of the individual components and you know how these components interact with one another, you can put together a representation of your system as a collection of components that interact and then use these mean times to failure to determine how the whole system will operate in terms of its failure, right? And this is something that's really done in practice. One uh, big example is a redundant disk, right? So you have a, a disk drive and that disk is gonna fail. And so oftentimes you have backups of this disk and these are live backups like you'd have in a RAID array. One disk uh, maintains a copy of the data. So if the primary fails, um, the backup automatically takes over, right? That's really important in things like data centers. And you can also get a RAID drive pretty uh, cheaply. RAID stands for redundant array of inexpensive disks. And there are different ways of how you maintain copies of this data. So in the book, uh, in the reading, there's an example for a redundant disk. And it gives some simple numbers, but you could absolutely come up with these numbers uh, from the specifications of the low-level components uh, reading the mean time to failure. Sometimes it's a time, uh, like in, if I turn it on some number of times, how many times can I turn it on before it fails? Sometimes it's a raw probability. If it's a mean time to failure, you can certainly uh, compute a probability from that. Out of how many days will it fail, right? Okay, so in the book, it says there's a 1% probability that a given hard drive is going to crash. And so typical practice is to have a spare or two. So in this particular example in the book, it has two backups and each of the backups, maybe these are more cheap disks than the primary. So their failure rate is higher. Uh, each backup has a failure rate of 2% or probability of 2%. That means if you run it for a million days, then there's a 2% chance of one on one of those days that it's gonna crash, right? So these components are independent. And what that means is that if one disk crashes, it doesn't affect the status of another, right? My crash does not affect the other disk crash. They operate independently, but the collection, the primary and the two backups are all running in the same system. So that independence part is really, really important. And that's how you get reliability uh, from having redundancy, multiple copies of things running. So therefore, if you're going to lose information in this, that means you have to lose the primary, you have to lose backup number one and backup number two. And suppose we only had the primary and two backups. Because if you lose the primary and both of those backups, now you're completely gone, right? That data cannot be recovered. And so one of the questions you might want to ask, and this is something people actually analyze uh, in data centers uh, for uh, systems like cell phones and other electronics, especially for systems like satellites and spacecraft, right? Satellite, you're not gonna go up there and repair it. It's just, it's done. So they're really, really concerned uh, for satellites uh, about the reliability and they do lots of simulation and analysis uh, to try to come up with real numbers for that. Um, so one of the questions is what is the probability that information is saved? So how are we gonna do this? Well, we know the individual probabilities of failures, bless you. Uh, so we're going to look at these interactions uh, in this general framework uh, called um, reliability. Okay, any question about this, the setup? Okay, so again, with any sort of probability, we talked about three points. What is happening, right? Um, what do you observe, right? So that talks about the sigma algebra, the observable events, and you have to be able to count them and define them. And this when can I see you again, that's the probability part. Okay. So let's talk about the first point. What is occurring? You have a disk drive, it's running, and then boom, it fails. Okay, that's easy enough. So you're looking for when you run this thing, when you power it up, is it gonna fail or is it not gonna fail? Okay, so you first have to turn it on in order uh, and observe something. Okay, so what do you observe, right? And they specify in the book, um, the hard drive crashing, that's an event they're calling H. 
um, the backup, the first backup, B1, crashing, right? That's what they call B subscriptive with one, subscript one, because it's the first backup. Um, and then the second backup crashing, that's an event uh, called B2, the subscript two, uh, because it refers to the second uh, backup. Okay, so now we have this, what do you observe, right? So you list out these events. Uh, there are three of them that they talk about in the book. But certainly it's more than that, and we're going to use the rules of probability that we've talked about uh, up to this point uh, to fill in what that more is. Okay. So when we observe these things, if we look at the sigma algebra as describing all that is possible, well, if something can crash, certainly it can not crash, right? It can run. So we're not done here. If we want to look at all the events that we could observe, we have to now look at that case, in the case of the hard drive crashing, that H bar, right? So for the event of the hard drive crashing, and I also am trying to use synonym C sub H just to try to introduce you to different notation or ways of thinking about it, the sigma algebra for the disk is going to consist of the event of crashing H and not crashing, right? Okay, likewise for the first backup, that first backup can crash. Remember, that's event B1. To fill in the sigma algebra completely, uh, that's going to include B1 bar, or the event of the first backup not crashing, right? Not B1. Likewise, for the second backup, we augment it, and we add in not B2 for that event of uh, the second backup not crashing. OK, so there's any questions about this? No? Make sense? OK, now I'm being very, very precise and kind of taking the scenic route um, versus getting to the point, because I really want, when this is accessible, uh, with a very simple example, want you to learn the process. OK, so this is pretty cumbersome, right? It's a pain in the butt to do all this, um, to say not C2, not CH. You know, that's, that's, that's really a pain. And so oftentimes, when you're doing this, you want to make things look better, make look more simple because it's a lot easier to work with when it looks more simple. OK, so we have this C sub H, meaning uh, the probability, or the event, rather, uh, that the hard disk crashes. And then C1 uh, for that event, uh, that the first backup crashes. And lastly, C2, that the second backup crashes. We talked about uh, filling out the sigma algebras to describe all the possible events that you can observe. So now, if we were to talk about H bar, right, that the hard drive does not crash, well, let's make it a lot easier. So let's create a new notation, and let's add R sub H. Um, hard drive is the subscript, so little h. C is for crash, and R is for run, right? It's a lot easier to think in terms of run and crash than H bar and all that other stuff. So we're going to introduce R sub H corresponding to the event of hard drive not crashing, and we're going to add R sub 1 corresponding to backup one not crashing or running. And likewise, we're going to add R sub 2 corresponding to backup two not crashing or running. So now I'm going to talk about C means for crash, and R means for run. It's a lot easier to think of that when you're trying to compute probabilities and trying to put together complex events, which are the union or intersection of things. Does that make sense? Any questions? So this is just a name change. And I state the name change just because it's a pain in the butt to say H bar, H, and set notation, all that stuff. It's a lot easier to use these little variables. OK, so let's fill in some numbers. That's sort of wiped away all the other stuff. And let's fill in some numbers. So CH, the probability that the hard disk crashes, it said 1%. Well, per kentum, 1 out of 100, that's 0.01 in decimal. OK, uh, likewise, C sub 1 is the probability that backup one crashes. So that's 0.02 in decimal, two hundredths. And likewise, for the second backup, C sub 2, in decimal, that's 0.02. OK, so we have those probabilities, the when can I see you again, based on what was given to us from the problem. Now let's fill in that other stuff we created using rules of probability. So let me ask you, R sub H, if C sub H, the probability or the event of uh, the hard drive crashing is 0.01, what is R sub H? Anyone want to put themselves out there, him or herself? No, what is R sub H? 
What do you think? Pardon? 99%. Okay, so point and JSON, right? JSON, thank you. So JSON says 99%. So what would be probability uh, for R1? What would that be? Pardon? 0.98. Kelsey, right? Kelsey says 0.98. All right. And likewise for R2? No? Nobody? 0.98. Who said that? Okay. Um, Kai, oh, you said that? Okay. So I heard two people. So you're Karen? Karen. And don't tell me. Kyrie. Kyrie. And Kyrie. All right. Thank you for sitting in roughly the same place. That helps me. And this is 0.98. Okay. So let me ask you this. More importantly, how did you do that? What rule did you apply? What rule? What rule? What do you think? So here we have our Venn diagram. And let's say we have sigma disk. And we have CH. And we have RH. Okay, and you were given what CH is, right? That probability was 0 0.01, but you gave me 0.99, and that's correct, but the important part is why, what rule? How did you do that? Is that magic? The what? I heard someone say compliment. Compliment? Compliment. <laughs> is he just pointing to you? Or did he... <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, Kwaku, right? So compliment. Can you be more specific? What compliment of what? What do you, What do you mean? Compliment. Mhm. Mm okay. So what is out of a hundred? What is a hundred? The full percentage. That is, pardon? The disc. So what here in the Venn diagram is 100%? The pardon? The entire thing, omega disk. So if omega disk is 100% and you have CH and there are two of them, well, things that are not CH is just the probability of omega disk minus the probability of CH, right? So the probability of anything, because it either runs or crashes, is 1, minus, this is 0 0.01, right? So that's your 0.99, okay? All right, so the why is particularly important. I want you to internalize going to the why, because that's going to give rise to the rules of probability. And you want to burn it into your memory. So, you know, you're, you're trying to cross the street uh, to go to... Um, I almost said Veracruzano. That's in Amherst, Mass. Um, what's the other, not Chipotle, what's the other place? Pardon? Qdoba, Qdoba. So let's say you want to go to Qdoba. I want a car to approach as the light turns yellow, and you automatically say, stop or not stop. This is my probability, right? I want you to internalize it so much that you see these rules in your sleep, right? Because that's how you get good at this, is by internalizing the rules and knowing when and how to apply them. So the rule to apply is called the law of total probability. It says the probability of anything, my sample space, space, place, a sample space, omega, anything that you can observe, is going to be 1. That's why you get that 0.99, right? Okay, great. So we apply this law of total probability, and that's just the answer. Um, so information is lost only when all three of these devices crash. Okay, so that means we want the probability of the intersection, so all these things happening at the same time. So we have H, the hard drive crashes, and at the same time, the first backup crashes, and at the same time, the second backup crashes. Now, we're already given that these three drives or these devices are independent. And it's a rule. Uh, we won't go over why that rule occurs, not now, but we'll in subsequent um, modules. But it's a rule that when you have the probability of the intersection of things and those things are independent, it's the product of the individual probabilities, right? And we'll talk about something called marginal probabilities uh, in a few more uh, modules, but we're not there yet now. So if the crashing is independent, 
so are the runnings. Why? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? If the crash is independent, the run is independent. Why do you think that is? It, yes? It's not going to affect that, but it's related. It's related to this 1 minus, right? Because if you said 1 minus the crash, right, that's what the run is. If the crashes were independent, then the sample spaces would overlap. And certainly there's other fix-ups you'd have to do that I'm not ready to talk about, at least not until you develop other machinery when we talk about joint distributions and continuous distribution. Okay? All right. So, yes, they run independently. The run state of one does not affect the run state of another, and therefore the crash state of one does not affect the crash state of another. Mathematically, you could say the crash state is one minus the run state, and therefore if the crash state is independent, so too is the run state. Right? But we'll talk about that in more detail when we talk about conditional probability. But for now, just memorize this fact, and then we'll kind of peel back uh, the layers, kind of like the number line, and tell you you can now do this. Okay? But we haven't developed that machinery yet. Okay, so what is the probability that information is saved? To say information is saved is the same as saying not lost. So if you lose information, when all three crash at the same time, so we have this and here, and it's the multiplication of the individual probabilities. Saved, another way of saying that, is the opposite of lost. Opposite of lost is the opposite of this product here, right? That's the probability of lost. So saved is like saying not lost. So saved is one minus the probability that it is lost, okay? And this is getting to a point I'll stress on Thursday. If you're trying to solve for a probability and expression, and you're finding it's too, too terribly difficult, a lot of moving parts, then try the negation. The negation might be a lot easier, and we'll see an example of that uh, when I carry this forward. And uh, my watch is fast, but the phone is accurate, so uh, 114. So let's stop here, and we'll continue on on Thursday. Please uh, put together your stick break and design your game. Um, okay, and we'll talk on Thursday, continue on, and hopefully fill in, finish the module. All right, I'll see you on Thursday.